What's up guys and welcome back to the channel. So for all the great things about the Model 3, like its amazing performance and its fantastic tech features, for a lot of buyers there is still one major drawback and that comes in the form of the battery. So that's what we're going to talk about in today's video. Let's get started. So to start, the Model 3 comes in three different variants, each with different estimates for the battery range. The Standard Range Plus Model 3 has a WLTP rated range of 409 kilometers. The Long Range has a range of 560 kilometers, and the Performance has a range of 530 kilometers. Based on that information alone, one of the main questions a person would have is, what is WLTP and how is it used to calculate the range of an electric car? So WLTP, or the Worldwide Harmonised Light Vehicle Test Procedure, was introduced by the European Union back in 2017. The procedure was devised as a replacement for the outdated NEDC, or New European Driving Cycle Test, which as we know was subject to significant shortcomings that enabled certain manufacturers to falsify their emissions test results, and it also produced unrealistic range estimations for electric vehicles. With WLTP, a number of key improvements were made to the test procedure to ensure it produced more realistic values. So what exactly were these changes? Specifically, the test cycle distance was increased from 11 km to 23.25 km. The average speed was increased from 34 to 46.5 km per hour. The test time was increased from 20 to 30 minutes. And the driving phases were changed from being 66% urban and 34% non-urban to 52% urban and 48% non-urban. However, you'll be quick to notice that even with the updated test procedure, it still does not accurately reflect what would constitute an average drive for a person here in Ireland. In particular, the 46 km per hour average speed limit that's used for the duration of the test is significantly lower than what most of us would drive on a daily basis. And critically for an electric vehicle, the average temperature of 23 degrees that was used for the duration of the test is significantly higher than the average temperature we'd have here in Ireland. So what does all this mean? Well, if we take it at face value, it basically means the WLTP rated range you see on the website is representative of the range you'd expect to get if you drove at an average speed of less than 50 km per hour with an ambient temperature of 23 degrees. And this immediately puts things into perspective. But let's dive a little deeper. Speed, temperature, gradient and acceleration are the four key things that influence the range of an electric vehicle the most. But to see why, let's take a look at the physics. When it comes to calculating the power usage of an EV, we need to look at two key factors, drag force and velocity. Power equals force times velocity. To calculate the drag force, we must break it down into three constituent components, rolling resistance, wind resistance, and gradient. Rolling resistance depends on the mass of the vehicle, which according to Tesla's website, is 1,847 kilograms for the Model 3 performance. If we multiply this by gravitational acceleration and the coefficient of friction for the tires, which I'm taking as 0 0.015, this gives us a result of approximately 272 newtons. Next, we have wind resistance. This depends on the square of the velocity times the air density times the drag coefficient of the vehicle times the frontal area of the car. In this case, I'm going to use a velocity of 100 km an hour, which I think is a good average speed for Irish roads, and plug in the values for drag and frontal area that are specific to the Model 3, which gives us a result of 240.32 newtons. Finally, we have the gradient resistance. This depends on the mass of the car times gravitational acceleration times the sine of the angle of the gradient. However, for this example, I'm just going to assume that we're driving on a flat surface so we get a clean baseline result. So if we plug in our values for rolling and wind resistance into our original equation of power equals force times velocity, we get a result of 14.231 kilowatts. Now what you'll see here is that velocity appeared in two of our equations, both in the wind resistance calculation and the final power equation, which ultimately means that our power usage increases with the cube of the speed. So if you're ever in a situation where you're running low on power, even decreasing the speed by as little as 20 km an hour can have a significant impact on the range of your electric vehicle. Next, we have the impact of weight and how it affects the amount of energy required to change speed. If we plug in our values for mass and velocity into the energy equation and convert the result to kilowatt hours, we get a result of 0.197 kilowatt hours. Finally, we have temperature. 
Here in Ireland we have an average annual temperature of about 10 degrees, which means that more often than not the heating system is going to be engaged. Various online tests have shown that the Model 3's resistive heating system uses approximately 4.3 kilowatts to maintain cabin temperature. So now that we have all the numbers, let's see how they add up. Our calculations for drag gave us a required power output of 14.231 kilowatts. Assuming we're on a 3 hour journey, I'm going to say we'll have 10 instances where the speed will change from 0 to 100 km an hour, which gives us a power demand value of 1.92 kilowatts. Adding this with the power required for the heater, we get a value of 20.451 kilowatts. Since the Model 3 long range and performance have a battery pack size of 75 kilowatt hours, it would take just over three and a half hours to drain the battery. And since we calculated an average speed of 100 kilometers per hour, that gives you a range of approximately 366 kilometers. Right, so based on those equations, I'd expect my real world range to be significantly less than the WLTP quoted figure. But let's see how it compares with the real world range that I get on my actual Model 3. On the touch screen, we can open up the application dock and click the energy icon. This will open up a graph of your energy usage over the last 50 kilometers or so. On the side, you can see a readout of your energy consumption per kilometer. In this case, you can see that my average consumption is 217 watt hours per kilometer. If we do a quick conversion, this gives us an efficiency of 4.6 kilometers per kilowatt hour. If you multiply this times the battery capacity of 75 kilowatt hours, we get a range of 345 kilometers on a full charge. Comparing my 366 kilometer estimate with my actual range, I wasn't actually that far off. My guess would be that the discrepancy in range is down to the fact that I do quite a lot of motorway driving and also I tend to accelerate quite harshly, which definitely eats into the battery range. Of course, your range will vary completely from mine depending on your driving style and also the driving conditions, but now at least you have the insight to know to take the WLTP ratings with a pinch of salt. Next up, charging. And most importantly, how long does it take? Since the charging rate depends on the type of charger you're using, let's go through some of the most common methods now. If you're charging using the 3-pin mobile connector that comes with the car, expect a charge rate of approximately 14 km per hour so between two to three days to fully charge. If you have a dedicated home charging installation, then you can expect a rate of 44 km per hour or eight to 12 hours to fully charge. If you're using an AC public charger, then you're looking at about 65 km an hour or between five to eight hours to fully charge. A 50 kW DC fast charger will give you around 180 km per hour, so about two to three hours to fully charge while the current generation of Tesla superchargers will give you about 240 km an hour or one and a half to two hours to fully charge. One thing to note about those charging time estimates is that they represent the time it would take to charge the car from zero to 100%. However, in real world scenarios, you're never really going to be doing that unless you're going on a very long road trip. Realistically, you'll really be charging the car from about 30% to 80%, which means you could basically have the charging times I mentioned previously. However, there are a few things to note about these charging rates that mainly apply to fast chargers. When you're using a fast charger, the temperature of the battery pack increases dramatically. This means that the air inside expands as the battery pack temperature increases, causing pressure release valves in the battery pack to release air inside. This results in a clanging sound, which is definitely noticeable if you're charging on a supercharger or 50 kW DC fast charger, but this is normal behavior, so it's nothing to worry about. You'll also note the sound of the compressor, which is used to maintain a most optimal temperature for the battery pack while charging. Because of all these temperature changes, you'll also note that the charging rate fluctuates over time. Typically, the charge will start at a slow rate, then ramp up to close to the maximum power output of the charger, and then ramp down again. The effect of this ramp down becomes very evident when the battery reaches an 80% state of charge, after which point the rate of charge will start to taper off significantly, even to levels as low as those as you'd find on a standard AC public charger. This is totally normal behaviour and it's designed purely to protect the battery pack from excess stress and also to ensure the longevity of the battery pack itself. This is also the main reason why people recommend charging to an 80 or 90% state of charge and saving 100% state of charge for longer journeys. The last topic on the list for today's video is battery longevity. Throughout the years, a number of people have complained that batteries only have a certain lifespan and after that lifespan has expired, they must be replaced by the user at a tremendous cost. 
And while this was true for the first generation of electric vehicles produced by Nissan and other manufacturers about a decade ago, it's certainly no longer the case. One of the key contributors to increased levels of battery degradation over time is poor thermal management. In the case of the first generation Nissan LEAF, they used a passive cooling battery design to save on cost. This meant that the system relied on air flowing over the bottom of the battery pack to cool it down and maintain thermal equilibrium. However, when the vehicle was in a state of charge and it was stationary, there was no air flowing over the battery pack, meaning that the temperatures in the battery got significantly high. This is similar to what you might experience if you're charging your phone on a fast charger and the back of the phone gets extremely hot. It's the same for an EV. This of course places tremendous strain on the battery cells and over time results in increased levels of battery degradation. However, since then, a number of changes have been made, both to the internal design of the battery cells themselves and to the thermal management system. In the case of Tesla, they use an active battery cooling system which pumps coolant liquid throughout the battery pack to maintain a thermal equilibrium. This, coupled with a variety of other technologies, has meant that the battery pack will last many years, with Tesla currently providing an 8-year warranty on all battery packs sold with new Teslas. Tesla have also announced that they'll be releasing a new battery pack design later in 2020 that's rated for 1 million miles of use, so you can expect improvements like these to continue with battery packs throughout the coming years. So that's it for today's video, I hope you found it interesting and if you have any questions be sure to drop them in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. As always if you like the video be sure to subscribe to the channel to keep up to date with my latest videos and until then I'll see you in the next one.